Hey everyone, it's Jay here, and we're back again with another episode of Cafe Verite, our look behind the scenes here at Spro Coffee in Hamden in Baltimore. First up is uh, a, one of our regulars who comes in. His name is Brian. He gets a cafe latte most every morning. And this is pretty much what he was doing. So as you all know, if you've been watching this series, this is about uh, life behind the bar. A little glimpse into the world of a professional barista and how we make drinks behind the bar and doing our thing. So the cafe latte is a pretty simple drink. You know, it's a double shot of espresso, like you see here. And we pull that into the cup we're serving in. in this case, it's a 12 ounce drink. So all of our drinks have a particular size. Like we're not a shop that offers, you know, a latte in four different sizes. We have a latte and it's one size, which is 12 ounce. So we've got some whole milk for Brian, steaming it up there. We, we, what we want for a latte is nice milk that is uh, well frothed, meaning that we want to have some frothing, but it also has to be very smooth and a lot of micro bubbles. We're looking for something really smooth and glossy. And that really just takes the, the correct amount of injection of the air into the milk as it's steaming to get that texture. You can kind of see a glimpse of the, a little bit of the latte art. You know, I'm not really a big latte artist. Some of my friends are really, really great. Like Caleb Cha out in, uh, in um, Australia. He's a, you know, one of the world barista champion latte artists or world, world latte art champions. Great guy, does amazing stuff. Um, so, and there's a lot of other baristas out there that really focus a lot on doing a lot of beautiful designs. I'm not one of them. I tend to just be a very simple kind of approach. I want to make people enjoy the milk, meaning that I want the, the milk to have smoothness and glossiness and sweetness to it, as well as a nice texture and maybe a little bit of art. So Brian usually comes in with his, um, with his dog, who he shares with his old partner. And um, today he doesn't have the, the dog with him. So he just, recently he was out in, uh, I think he was out, He's a big climber, so he's always out climbing, camping, going, doing something on the outdoors. So after the weekend, he comes back and tells us all about his stories, about what he does. The next drink we're starting up is uh, for one of our, our longtime regulars, Dave. And Dave is always in the shop. And you, if you come to our shop, you've probably seen him there, hanging out, greeting you, talking, offering you any kind of story. Dave's a really great raconteur. And um, he's actually a really interesting guy who has a lot of collections of like African and Asian antiquities and arts. Really, I got to see his house the other week and <clears throat> just really a, a, an amazing treasure trove of African, Asian, so African art, Asian pottery. Then there's an eclectic collection of like antiquities, mainly like, um, you know, I don't know if it would, the term would be cabinets, but painted like cabinets and stuff like that. It really just fascinating, fascinating stuff. And so Dave comes in every day and wants an Americano. Most of the day he gets an Americano. Sometimes he'll get tea, but usually Americano. So we just make it real simple. Hot water, float, <laughs> float the, uh, the double shot of espresso on top, and then that's it. We just take it out to him, let him, let him enjoy it. And he kind of hangs out for a couple hours at a time. He knows a lot of the guests that come in. Most of the guests know him. He's typically there in the morning, so if you wanted to come by and meet him, come by before, uh, I'd say come by before 11. Usually he's there before 11. All right, so we have another guest in. Um, she would like to have a latte with some Splenda. And this is the kind of thing that, that makes it a little bit easier from my perspective is when the, the guest comes in and they're like, oh, you know, can I get a... Can I get a drink? And I would like to have a little bit of sweetener with it. And in the, in the house, we normally have uh, Splenda as an artificial sweetener, as well as some Panela, which is this type of natural molasses sugar that's from Colombia, as well as some Demerara sugar that we get from Tanzania. And then every once in a while, we might mix it up with something like um, maybe a little brown sugar, maybe cane sugar, but not, nothing, not always that often. We like to give a, a little bit of flavor with some of the sugars if people like them. And the nice thing is that if you come in and you're like, hey, I would like to have my drink sweetened, we're happy to mix that sweetener in for you. Like I said in the last video, our concern really is about 
letting you come in and enjoy the beverage. We want you to concern yourself with consumption rather than preparation, right? A lot of places you go to and, you know, they've got some kind of convent bar over there and they give you your drink, they give you, or they just give you the drink. They don't even give you the lid. They give you the drink and you go and do your thing and they have lids and all that at their convent bar. Quite frankly, I really hate that stuff. Convent bars, I think, are just nasty, you know, dirty places because, you know, invariably the employees of the cafe don't necessarily keep up with it. So it's always got mess, spilled milk, spilled drink, spilled sweetener, leftover rubbish, you know, and it's, and then, or the, uh, if they have the, the creamers out, you know, in those thermal, thermal things, they're invariably going to be empty. So it's just kind of a, to me, it's really just a frustrating thing that I, I we never did at Spro. Any of the iterations of Spro, we've never had a condiment bar. The closest thing we have is a couple of the jars sitting there at the side, but really that's more there so that we can if we can easily engage the guest to do it for them. And it's really a whole nother thing for most guests. They're, they're kind of, a lot of people, especially early on, were kind of wigged out by it. You know, they were kind of like, oh, I don't want to uh, to do that. But we got them to work with it. Okay, so here's a great one. This is from the wine source. It's uh, four iced coffees, one cappuccino, a pour over, an espresso, and an ice mocha. So we've got one, two, four, five, six, seven, so eight drinks. And especially during this past year while we had the pandemic, you know, of course, business has been very, very low comparatively to our normal thing. And so every time the guys from the wine source would come in, they would have these big orders, you know, five to eight drinks or even sometimes even more. And it was always kind of during the week that fun challenge, you know, to to blend all the drinks together. Because like I said in the last video, we're trying to get all the drinks to come together. Now, when they get to be this this kind of volume of in a single order, that's much more difficult. But the nice thing about this is that it's about it's like a puzzle. You know, you're trying to think about, okay, I've got eight drinks. How do I put them all together and deliver to them in the optimal way? And now, now Andrew, who comes in and usually get, gets the order, he still has to walk back to the, to the wine source. <clears throat> and uh, that takes a few minutes. So it's always a, it's, it's always a, it's a puzzle. So first things up is the, the pour over. The pour over takes about four minutes to do, right? So we're doing it in the Avid Clever. We're adding, you know, 24 grams to make the 12-ounce cup. We're adding some of the water. So right now we're at about 100 grams of water, 100 milliliters of water. And we start our timer. We're going, to, and then I'm going to finish up with uh, the full 350 mils. And we're timing this. So this initial steeping time, this immersion, is going to be three minutes total. And then we'll place that on top of the cup and it will drain through. And that should take another minute. So we've got four minutes to go with this drink, right? Now it's time to figure out, okay, what drinks are we going to do? I've already set out the two trays that we're going to put the eight drinks. And also I've already decided that, okay, we're going to need to do, four, four, we're going to put four, all four of the cold brew coffees in one of the trays. And here, are, here I am preparing the cold brew. And so we have our cold brew, and when we get it out of our, our brewer, it's actually a concentrated brew. So we're actually going to mix it one-to-one -one to get it to actual drinking strength. It's kind of, for those of you who like whiskeys, it's kind of like a whiskey thing. You know, when, they come, when the whiskey comes out of the barrel, it's really, really, you know, high proof. In order to bottle it, you actually add water to cut it down and to lower the proof. And that's pretty much the same process we use with the cold brew coffee. So that's what I'm doing. I'm taking our, we, have, we usually have one jug that's the concentrate and one jug that's the drinking strength. And so we just mix that up as we go along. So now we've all, now I'm getting the, looks like I'm getting the milks. Oh, the milks are getting ready for both the mocha and the cappuccino. They're going to be two different sizes, you know, so the larger 20 ounce pitcher, we're filling that up with uh, about halfway. And then the smaller 12 ounce pitcher, that's going to be for the cappuccino. So we're utilizing just under half. So I'd say about 40% of the total capacity of those pitchers is how much milk we're filling it into. And then the first thing is going to come up, looks like we're going to, oh, we're preparing, I'm preparing the, uh, the four cups of ice for the cold brew. 
And I think I'm going to put those in the tray before pouring it. And then also, since we're doing an ice mocha, oh no, those are, yeah, they, I'm sorry, those are two, not 20, that's not a 20 ounce pitcher, those are both 12 ounce pitchers with about 40% filled with milk because it is an ice mocha. So we're going to, I'm going to steam up the ice mocha first. As you can see, the cup that I just placed there is filled with ice to the top. And like I've said in previous videos, we actually you steam the milk a little bit to increase the sweetness and get the texture, then pour it over the ice to chill it back down. And I think that really makes a big difference. So here we go, go back to the, to the brew bar where it's time to get the, the cup ready. And, you know, I, I, after, you, after so many times of people ordering from the wine source, you kind of know who's, who's getting what. And so this one is for Joanne. So I sometimes put a little hello, Joanne, to her. To her. And, um, yeah, just a little way to say hello and for a guest we don't always get to see. But that we're thinking about. All right, so as you can see, place the, the clever on top of the cup for Joanna. Now that's flowing through, and that's gonna, we're just going to let that sit there and flow through. The nice thing about the clever is that because it, it covers the, cup, the, the, cap, the top completely, it actually will hold in and act as a little bit of an insulation for the coffee to keep warm, okay? Now you see this small little glass there. I've all, I placed some chocolate syrup in the glass. And we're gonna, like we did in the, I talked about it previously, we're gonna pull the double espresso shot over the, the chocolate and let that mix together in the glass. So I'm preparing both shots that we're gonna be using for the ice mocha as well as the cappuccino. Now there's also an espresso, if you recall, in this order. The espresso, because it's just a raw espresso and you know it has the, the crema that's always gonna be dissipating, the espresso is going to be the very, very last drink that I pull for this order. And if any order, like if there's multiple drink orders that has an espresso, and it's always the espresso that's last. Perhaps the, the latter priority. So if, if we're going to do, if we, let's say we had Americano, Americano would also be to the last because we're trying to just preserve the crema of the espresso. So here we go. We're rolling now. Now we're making the cappuccino. I've already placed the cup and started brewing, I believe. And now we're steaming the milk for the cap, tapping it out. Oh yeah, they're both brewing. Nice, okay. There it is, we're gonna pour the cappuccino. All, all gone, so just the right amount of, of milk that we steamed. Cap it, place it on the, oh, oh. <laughs> and now we've got our, our espresso and chocolate. So we're going to mix the espresso and chocolate together before pouring it into the cup. There it is. Leading with the spoon. And like I said before, the, the spoon is, offers a, a pathway for the liquid to flow through so it doesn't splash over the, the, the white foam that's on top of the cup. We really want to preserve the white foam as much as possible. All right, so that's the mochas in the, in the tray. And now we've got the, the pour over coffee. The brewed the house coffee is capped and ready to go. And so one of the things that I was doing there is I'm, I'm adjusting the cap because I'm looking for the front of the cup. And for, in, in Spro, the front of the cup is the side of the cup that is opposite the seam. And we want to line up the, the sippy part of the lid opposite the seam because, you know, and this is something that's from a long time ago when perhaps paper cups didn't have a perfect seal and sometimes it would drip. It's a hold off, it's a hold back from that. And even though modern technology really delivers great cup quality, we still want to be concerned and be careful about that just because that would be the weakest point. And so if we can keep that seam away from the customer's shirts, essentially, um, all the better. You know, nothing, nothing's more frustrating for someone to be drinking than to have it dribble over them, right? All right, so got the espresso ready, pulling the espresso now, and now we're bringing the cold brew, pouring them out, capping them up, and that's going to wrap it up. There it is. Switch off the espresso. Click. Good. Iced coffees are ready. 
And you hear me saying iced coffee, cold brew, really, it's bro, it's interchangeable. We don't really, like there's a lot of people out there that are talking about, oh, ice, cold brew is this, cold brew is really for us, it, we don't make that this heavy distinction. We do a certain way, right? We, 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 do, we do our iced coffee, cold brew in one of two ways. We'll sometimes use the cold brew tower, which we have in the back of the shop. You'll see, you've probably seen them if you've been to our shop, these really beautiful uh, glass and wood towers that we brew the coffee in. Or we'll do in larger batches for a style called toddy, where you're immersing the, the ground coffee for 16 hours. And even the tower, it's a slow drip tower that takes you know 12 hours or so to make a batch. So either way, what we, either way that we make it, we don't really differentiate. If you ask us, we'll tell you exactly how it's being made. But in a naming, we don't use it. We don't use these naming conventions like everybody else does. All right. So here's Andrew's getting his. Uh, he's coming to get the coffee. <laughs> he's a loyal guy. Comes in, hangs out outside, and then when the the drinks are ready, he he comes back in and he's ready to go. We really thank the guys from uh, The Wine Source. They're really great. And if you're not familiar with The Wine Source, The Wine Source is a, well, a wine shop, probably one of the biggest in Baltimore, and certainly a very deep wine shop. I mean, not only do they have wines from all over the world and just some really wonderful selections, but they are also very deep in their selection for beers. If you're a craft beer person or imported beer person, they've got all of that stuff. Even domestic stuff, they've got it, you know, by, by the case or however you're buying it. You want to get a crowler, you get, come and get a crowler. You want to get it by the keg, get it by the keg. And then they've got like our charcuterie and cheese section. That's just wonderful. Some bread. So, you know, really kind of like an a all-around gourmet shop. And so we go there quite often. And it's great to have them come over and, and drink our coffee. And, you know, because everybody that works there really is an expert in their field. And they're really, you know, anyone that's in the food business that, that really knows their stuff, everyone's a little bit of a hedonist, right? because we just deal in such sensual luxury type items. And so when other people in the crafts realize, you know, you know, the, your labors, that's always a wonderful thing. And it's an honor to serve them. All right. So as with anything, it's time to brush down and catch up between runs. This really is the key to working behind the bar is that you know, you're going to make a little bit of mess while you're working and you need to brush it up and clean up between runs, you know, because that's really the battle is getting ready for the next one. And the next one is Zach. And speaking of the wine store, Zach's also a really big wine aficionado. He's, a, he's actually started his own import company in, in Maryland. So he, and the way the, law, the import laws, alcohol laws in Maryland work is that you can be an importer, but you can only sell in Maryland. Like you can't sell anywhere else. So he's... A Maryland-based distributor, he, he does sakes from Japan, a lot of biodiverse wines, a lot of natural wines. That's his real focus, and some really pretty stuff. He's, he's got some stuff from Austria called the Meinklang, which is really pretty. I tried some of their orange-colored wine. I don't know, I don't know if it's, is it orange, but it's really nice. And then he had this citrusy yuzu-based, or not yuzu-based, but yuzu-infused or yuzu-juice sake that was just lovely mix it with a little bit of seltzer water and fantastic or sparkling water fantastic and so zach's a real great guy he comes in maybe about once a week or so orders a double shot cappuccino i mean a double shot espresso and uh you know talks a little bit of story about uh wines and such so really interesting great guy that comes in and part of the Part of the approach of working behind the bar is that we want to try to make the experience for the guest as seamless and as easy as possible. Meaning that while I'm pulling the shot, I'm also you know, trying to, to ring him in, into the POS, process his credit card, so that the time that he has to wait before he enjoys his beverage is kept to a minimum. And that's really what we try to do as much as possible. And of course, Zach sees the camera, so he's asking me, well, what's the camera for? And so I'm explaining to him, this is for the Cafe Verite series here on YouTube for all of you to enjoy. And, you know, just uh, 
like most things, you know, in a shop, like a coffee shop or someplace, like a, what they call the third place, people come in, hang out a bit, chat, do whatever. It's always a nice time. Share, you know, it's a chance for people to share their lives with other people, whether it's myself or other guests that are in the house. And also one of the great things is that people come in and there's such a diversity, you know, a lot of guests will come in and they won't know each other, but they'll have the opportunity to talk and to interact and to meet. And that's something that at Spro we really have worked to cultivate. You know, if you come in, you're going to notice that there's no, there's no music. There's no Wi-Fi. So it's really a place where we try to encourage people to interact. So the next drink up is another Americano. This is uh, for our guy, William Hughes. We call him Bill. And uh, Mr. Hughes is a longtime Baltimorean, a part-time movie star. He's been in a number of John Waters flicks. He had a, a somewhat notable role in a movie called Pecker that was also shot in our neighborhood in Hamden back in the 90s. And uh, Bill comes in practically every day, gets an Americano, hangs out with Dave and a couple of the other regulars. And uh, knows a lot about Baltimore. He writes a bunch of books. Like he wrote, a, he gave me one of his copies, a book called Creating a New Ireland. That is um, fascinating to read. I mean, it's really interesting. You get a lot of guests that come in and they're, they just have a lot of interest. You know, there are, some of them are authors. You know, Bill was a lawyer, worked for the city state's attorney's office and did all kinds of interesting things. Knew a lot of, knows a lot of people in old Baltimore. You know, he actually came from an area called Locust Point, which is a, a place where I spent a lot of my, uh, well, not a lot, but a bit of my childhood because my best friend, Victor Dota, is from that area. And uh, sadly, Victor passed away earlier this year in 2021. And, you know, well, we were friends since first grade. And so it was really sad. But getting to know Bill, you know, there's a connection to Locust Point that we both have that I think is really unique about Baltimore. So it's, it's an interesting neighborhood, you know, and... Um, just part of the interesting fabric that makes the city. And so there's Bill. He comes in, always reading the, uh, the New York Post, sharing whatever anecdotes he's getting out of that. <laughs> and then these guys just sit around and chat. And like I was saying before, like the nice thing about the cafe is that we try to cultivate an atmosphere where, where people can interact with each other. So we don't have Wi-Fi. We don't have music. We've had a, a bit of pushback on that over the years, but that's that's kind of what we've held firm for since we started the Hampton location. Mainly because we want people to have that opportunity to interact. And it's not because we don't want people to use their laptops. If you want to bring in your laptop and use it, you're ha we're happy to let you do that. And you want to stay there for as long as you want, we're happy to ha accommodate that as well. However, however, we just don't have Wi-Fi, that's all. Like we've had different people like comic book artists come in and spend a couple hours drinking coffee and, you know, doing their animation and, you know, hanging out. And uh, we've had physicists coming in. You know, so it's a really interesting group of people. And then we have ladies like this one here who comes in every once in a while and wants to get a latte and has it sweetened. This is going to be an iced latte. So typically for the iced latte, we're going to add the syrup to the bottom of the cup before we add the ice. And then, as you already know, we're adding the frothed and uh, heated milk. And again, that, that, that steaming of the milk heats it up, converts those sugars and makes the milk sweeter while also giving it texture. And that's, to me, that's really, it's a very sensuous experience to have the mocha or the, the iced latte because you're, you're not only just drinking a cold drink, but you're also getting this really nice mouth feel from the foam and you're getting a nice sweetness from the milk. And this is something that most cafes don't do. Like, I don't know how, why they don't think about it. I was taught this way by my mentor, John, John Sanders and John Hornall from uh, Heinz Public Market Coffee in, in uh, the Seattle area. And they taught me how to do lattes this way. And I've always thought it was a stellar way to do it. But so few places do this. So we train all of our baristas, and I'm, I was nice to hear that uh, one of our former baristas, when she went to when she left to start her own coffee company, continued that style of drink making for iced lattes, and that was really wonderful to hear. And so, hopefully, that continues. And ho actually, hopefully, it spreads because it really it's a beautiful way to enjoy your iced latte. 
then I think more people would really respond well. But, it, you know, I guess a lot of people think that it takes too much work. All right, here's another gentleman coming in for another Americano. And, you know, Americanos, Americanos, lattes, ice lattes, we get a lot of those, especially now with the ice drinks. As it's getting, in, we're now in June, and so it's getting to be pretty warm. You know, Baltimore summers can be rather brutal. It's into the 90s, into high humidity, and man, it is just sometimes quite a beast. <laughs> the weather can be quite beastly. So here we are again, Americano, double shot of espresso. We're going to take the, well, as you notice, we take the spouts off of it so that it makes the, so the cups will fit underneath the portafilter. And so our idea is that we always want to pull the espresso into the vessel that we're serving it in as much as possible. And this, these stainless steel portafilters from La Marzocco actually have removable spouts. So we can pop the spout off and on and gain greater clearance for the cups to fit underneath. And I, I really, when they when they finally came out with those, I, we snatched them up right away and upgraded our machines with them because it's a wonderful, for, and from a professional standpoint, it's wonderful because it allows us to do these kind of things, brew the brew an Americano directly, ice lattes directly, and things that we wouldn't be able to do if the spark, if we didn't have removable spouts. Prior to this, we had to use uh, what we call naked portafilters where we actually chop off the bottom of the portafilters, exposing the basket inside. All right, so here comes a couple guys. Uh, Al is a, on the left is a photographer who, with um, in, in, an independent photographer in the area, he shoots. Uh, I think he shoots mostly Fuji, and he's coming in for a coffee with milk and sugar. So Al comes in every once in a while. He did some uh, great photographer works at a place called Service Photo in Baltimore, which is also in the neighborhood. And Service has been this uh, photo company uh, camera shop that's been around since before I was in high school. And they're one of the few places in America, I think, that are left that where you can really come in, look at really great quality, high-end camera gear. They've got used departments, and you're always being tempted. If you, if you like cameras, you're always tempted there because they've got so much interesting stuff. I try to avoid going there, though I am there nowadays, especially after we started this YouTube channel, at least once a week. And then the guy on the right is Steve. Steve usually, this is kind of a weird thing, you know, Steve, it's a weekday, and Steve only comes in normally during the weekend, so to see him during the week is always a treat, you know. Steve's been a long-time regular, who usually comes in and gets a latte for him and his wife, so, and he brings his own tray, so that's always a <laughs> very nice of him to do. So here we are, we've got the, uh, the brewed coffee for Al rolling. Now I've got to do two lattes. So this is when it gets really, for me, it gets quite more interesting because it's a, it's a challenge. It's more of a puzzle to put together how to do all the drinks and keep it timely and keep the drinks together, keep them in order. Sometimes, you know, I may not keep the drinks in order, meaning that like if we've got a few orders pending that I'm working on and somebody comes in with something that I can finish quickly, I, I might just finish quickly and let them take their drink before the other because it kind of doesn't make sense to wait. Like, I'll try to get ahead with people in the shop. That Like, if so, we've got these three drinks that are working right now. If somebody else was to walk in, I'd try to talk to that person and see what are they, what are they interested in. If I can start that drink that they're asking, I'll start it. If not, at least it'll be in my mind so that I'm mentally thinking about what do I need to do to get that drink rolling as fast as possible. Right, so if it's another latte, I need to I need to attend to Steve's two lattes first before I can start a third or, or any kind of drink that needs the espresso. There we are, we got two. So the nice thing about I would like to say for Al's drink, you know, I've already placed the sweetener in his cup. It's brewing on the Clever. So the Clever, the nice thing with the Clever, it doesn't really need a lot of attending to. Once it's rolling, you can kind of let it do its thing. So that gives you a little bit of breathing room and allows you to do other things, like making these two lattes. Oh, actually, I've already finished Al's drink. He's, he's already <laughs> picked it up and wrapping it up and... 
We used to have Java jackets. We've kind of gotten away from that because, you know, not everybody wants it. And the cost isn't necessary. I don't know if we're really saving any money by buying extra products. So for those that do ask, we do dub we just double cup now. And not too many people ask for it. But, you know, I understand if you want it, we're happy to give it to you. All right, so here's the two lattes all ready to go. The nice thing about having regulars, you kind of get to know them after a while, especially over time. Like Steve's been coming to us for years, so it's, it's always interesting to get to know people and really see how they're doing, how their family's doing, their spouses, their partners, their children, whatever. You know, and that's really a wonderful thing. So now that Steve's gone and Al's got his drink, now it's back to uh, getting everything together and uh, preparing, you know, cleaning up the machine. So I want to make sure that the portafilters are empty and rinsed out. And then we'll want to clean up the bar a little bit, you know, brush off the excess coffee grounds. And then there's Dave. Dave's going to... Dave likes to drop a tip off at the end, end of his stay or towards the end of his stay. So that looks like what he's doing. And then also now that we're getting, you know, resetting, I want to take the pictures to the back and um, clean them out. So we've got another guest in for cold brew. And, you know, cold brew, we take our, cold brew is a 16 ounce drink. The cup is about halfway full with ice, maybe just under half. I don't want to give too much ice because, you know, I, when I go to places, I don't like it when they've jammed it with ice completely um, for no reason. Like, for example, if you when we, when we make the ice moat drinks, we are jamming the, the ice filled in the cup, but the heat of the, the liquid is actually melting the ice and creating the drink that we're looking for, right, the volume that we're looking for. So... We don't worry too much about that. But for drinks like this, where, where it's already brewed and like ready to go at user strength, we do about just under half of ice. Because it's, it's a pretty hot day. And, you know, actually I was... Just walking, oh, here's a couple guys. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> These two guys, they came in from Timonium. Two, two old friends had to go to like a doctor's appointment and they wanted to, uh, to say something. They saw the camera and I thought we'd include them. A little bit of donut action there. Once in a while, I want to do some what we call quality control. And so this is Sarah. Sarah's uh, an old, well, I guess she's an old friend now. She married my, uh, my old friend and barber, Bubs. And Bubs has a place called... I want to say, you know, I, always want, I, I always want to say Tip Top, but that's not right because Tip Top is the brand of pomade that they use. <laughs> two Bits. It's Two Bits Barbershop. So her husband uh, started a place called Two Bits Barbershop across the street from us. And, um, you know, I've been going to Bub's now for eight years for getting my hair cut. So I've known Bub's for a long time. And he finally started his uh, barbershop last, win last summer, 2020, in August. And... Um, Really great place to go. I enjoy getting my hair cut there. Nice group of guys. Sarah actually works at another barbershop downtown normally, but a couple of days a week when she's off from her other job, her other barbershop, she comes up here and, and uh, does a couple cuts at Two Bits. So if you have the time you want to get a haircut, come up to Hamden, get the Two Bits haircut. They're right across the street. Then come get coffee. And this gentleman comes in, and he's uh, looking for espresso, and it's looking at the croissants. You know, typically, with this guy, I didn't really think much about it. You know, we, we, we have these nice croissants, and the croissants that I've, I've, I've chosen for recently is, are these nice croissants that are nice, there's a nice crumb and nice flakiness. It's got really nice loft, and it has a bit of a shell. It's, it's we used to have a... a croissants from a friend of mine, Joseph Poupon, who owned a place called Patisserie Poupon in downtown Baltimore. Unfortunately, with the, the arrival of the pandemic and the shutdown, 
we just were, our business was so severely impacted that we just couldn't sustain the minimums that made it worthwhile f for Joseph to send a driver to us. So we held off on our, on our ordering from them because of that. And so I've been forced to look for other venues for some of our pastries. And uh, this one place that I found that has these croissants are, are really nice. And they had this, it's called Nutella croissant, which is filled with Nutella. And I thought that was something I'd never seen before. And I thought it was really interesting. And so I tried them and they're really quite nice, especially, you know, it was like, like now they're really good loft, a good crumb, little bit of like flakiness, some hazelnut, chopped hazelnuts on the top. I mean, I really enjoy them. And so we've been using them and this guy walks in and so... He ordered a double shot espresso as well as the uh, the croissant, and um, then suddenly he gets a phone call, and he's talking to whoever he's talking to. He's speaking to them in French, and you know, obviously he speaks French. Obviously he's French, and so suddenly it makes me worried. Like I'm worried at this point. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this guy speaks French. He must know croissants, and he is he gonna like the croissant? Is he gonna hate the croissant? I don't know. So that's really, as you see me doing, like I'm, I guess I'm ringing in the, uh, the transaction, but that's really what's in the back of my mind is how is he going to find this croissant? You know, this is a, a typical thing you find in people in Paris. You know, they go and get a, a, an espresso and a croissant. That's what I would do. In, that's what I do in Paris. I found this place close to the hotel, I like to stay in, in, uh, the seventh and, um, what's it called? Las Delices en Mimi, something like that. And it's right off the Rue Amelie. It'll nice, be lovely almond croissants that I really enjoy. All right, so as you can see, we've got another guest coming in. One of our other regulars sitting there in the back and trying to catch some flies, looks like. But uh, that's David. He's a, he's a lawyer in the area. Actually, he's really a lawyer from Houston, but he lives here as well. And... Uh, he comes in, when he's in town, he comes in almost every day, and so he gets usually a cappuccino, and so that's what we're going to be preparing for him. He's a great guy, also a, an avid tennis player. There it is, David's cappuccino. And, you know, the cappuccinos, we try to, we, we do have one size. Like I said earlier in this video, we have one size for every drink. And so lattes are 12 ounces, Cappuccinos are six, so we're actually using eight ounce cups, but the technical size is six. And so that's kind of what we, what we're, we were putting together. So I'm grabbing the milk, filling up the pitcher. And for those of you come into the shop, uh, to the right of the espresso machine is actually a, a pitcher rinser and drying center. You might have noticed that I don't actually use that. And typically when I'm working, like especially during this pandemic, and I'm working by myself, I tend not to use the pitcher rinser, mainly because I don't really feel like I need that speed because we haven't had, the pandemic has kind of, you know, we haven't had the, the crush of, of business that we normally had in the past. So I find it just as easy to walk over to our hand wash sink or rinse sink and uh, rinse out the uh, pitchers before using them. So it's, it's a little bit, for me, it's a little bit simpler. And also it's one less, you know, not by not using the pitcher rinser, it's one less item that I have to really clean at closing. So it's a little bit of both, you know. <laughs> You know, it's my way of trying not to uh, have too much to clean so I can, you know, get out of there in, in a good amount of time. But there it is, cappuccino. One of my favorite drinks, actually, because it's just a, a nice, simple, and really well-balanced. You know, you've got more or less two ounces of espresso with two ounces of foam, two ounces of uh, milk. And that's a really nice way to do it. And so this woman comes in with her husband. They would like to have a Raisin Danish and a Topo Chico. And again, the raisin danish that we're, that we're getting now, they're really nice and flaky. The, they do a real nice lamination, this bakery. And I kind of enjoy them. Simple, not too expensive, not too crazy. And then uh, the Topo Chico that she's going to have, um, we keep them in the refrigerator. We have Topo Chico, and, uh, which is from Monterrey, Mexico. 
as well as the Mexican Coke, which is a little bit of an interesting thing. I don't know if you've seen this other video on YouTube by a guy named Joshua Harris. He did this kind of video, uh, I guess, expose on the Mexican Coke and how while we've been thinking that Mexican Coke is made with cane sugar, a lot more of the high fructose corn syrup is getting into the Mexi into Mexico's um, supply. So a lot of that's being changed. I don't know if they're doing it for export, when they're exporting the stuff to America or they're just changing in Mexico as well. I mean, you know, everything's changing. All this globalization also means that we're getting um, some of the bad, you know, the, the corn syrup. And there is a big difference. And I wonder if the big difference is in the flavor of the Mexican Coke. Is it, is it, is it strictly because we're thinking that it's something else, meaning that we think that it's cane sugar, or is it maybe even just the fact that it comes in a glass bottle? I wonder if the glass retains the Coke in a certain way that just gives it a, a sharper effervescence than, you know, cans or plastic bottles. That, that's just a thought. All right, so the husband wants a cafe latte, which is, a, again, simple drink, 12 ounces, double shot of espresso, and then the remainder of the volume is the steamed milk. And what's the big, some people want to know, what's the difference between latte and a cappuccino? And really, besides, other than the volume of the difference to eight, you know, six ounces versus 12, the real difference with the, with the, the latte and the cappuccino is the amount of foam, right? With the cappuccino, typically you're going to increase your foam, your, your, the, when you're steaming the milk, you want to, increase the volume of the pitcher by 50%, right? You want to really increase it quite a bit, and that's going to give you a nice deep amount of foam for cappuccino, whereas in latte, you want to increase the, the pitcher volume by 25% with the steaming, and that should give you a nice little layer of foam for your lattes, and also one that's going to be good for creating the designs for latte art. I think with a lot of the, the, the more focused latte artists, they're actually even going thinner milk so they can get more intricate patterns. Like you see some of these guys and they've got very, very intricate patterns of like unicorns and phoenixes and dragons maybe. Barney. I'm not sure. And... Uh, you know, it's been a while since we've judged the, the latte art competitions. I mean, it's it's been over 18 months since I've actually judged any of the competitions out there. Normally, I'm judging a number of the barista, latte art, Brewers' Cup competitions around the world. And, of course, we've all been home for such a long time now. All right, so here we are. We've got the, this couple has, has their drinks, the latte, the Topo Chico, and their Raisin Danish. I hope they found that enjoyable. Today's weather looks pretty good. It's not terribly hot yet. It gets, it'll get hot. It'll get hot. All right, here comes another guest coming in. And it looks like we're having a latte for this one judging by the volume of the pitcher. Really, we don't use the pitchers for anything but those sides, the 20-ounce pitchers, we don't really use them anything but like lattes and mochas. Yeah, they're double shot espresso, a little bit of grinding. We're looking for about 21 grams for a double shot. I'm pulling that again directly into the cup, a little bit of steaming. To clear to purge and uh, wiping of the thing to make sure uh, the steam wand to make sure that it's nice and clean before steaming and then after steaming. You know, for this series of videos, I've been trying to figure out where is a nice spot for the camera. Like this angle, the other videos you've seen from the reverse angle, 
This one I think is kind of interesting. You get to see the the dining area, the seating area, and you get to see you get to see the the, the guests that are actually coming in. I, I, let me know in the comments what you think about the the camera viewpoints and which one you like best. Maybe we can do something more. We only have one camera to use, so that's why there's not multiple angles of it. Plus, that would get a little bit crazy. All right, so now we get the uh, the payment. I kind of so you know I mentioned earlier that I'm trying to find ways to make it faster, but it's also sometimes I just wait till we're done, and then you know I, I want the guests to kind of relax. And here we are, father and son coming in. They haven't seen each other in a while, and uh, got to talk to them for a bit. Really nice guys, and uh, they want a house coffee and a macchiato. And that's the funny thing, you know, people come in, they're asking a macchiato, and if, I had, if I'm not really familiar with you, I tend to ask the person if they're familiar with the kind of macchiatos that we offer them. And of course, I'm asking this because most people tend to be, a lot of people that come into the shop and they're like, I'd like a macchiato. You, you kind of have to feel it, you, maybe, you're, maybe where there's a little bit of stereotyping going on, but you kind of have to kind of be, get a feel of the person and you have to try to figure out, okay, does this person understand? What I'm trying to figure out is, does this guest understand what we say, what we mean when we write macchiato on the menu? Or do they believe that it's, that we're offering the Starbucks style macchiato, you know? And, and what is a Starbucks macchiato for those of you who are not familiar? The, the Starbucks caramel macchiato is basically, in our world at Spro, would be the equivalent to a vanilla latte. Vanilla latte with, um, and, and, and the Starbucks macchiato, of course, puts whipped cream on top with a caramel drizzle. So their macchiato, I don't even know how they got to that point, especially since Howard Schultz was all about, you know, the Italian espresso thing. But in our world, the macchiato really is double shot of espresso with a little bit of steam milk. Ours is a little bit different. I guess ours is a more of a sorry, Seattle derivative of the macchiato. The, the true Italian-style macchiato is basically just the double shot of espresso with a spoonful of milk foam to mark the top, hence the name macchiato. But sometimes that's a little bit bitter and a little bit harsher for some people. So the style that, that we learned, that I learned, that we continue to to promote is one where we're using steamed milk or steamed half and half and putting that almost in a one-to-one -one ratio to the espresso. And I think that delivers a really creamy, sweet, lovely macchiato that, that's really enjoyable to drink. I have had some macchiatos that were just very traditional Italian with just a little bit of the foam. And I, it's probably because I, I found the espresso to be very bitter that I, I didn't really enjoy it. But I think the macchiatos that we, the style of macchiatos that we make, and some people call it a, a piccolo or something like that. And, but I think with this, it's a better balance of milk to, to espresso. And I think that's a, a lovely way to do it. So the house coffee in this case, you know, it's brewing and that's taking the time. As you notice on the bar, you can see that the portafilter has already been filled and tamped with the coffee. I've got the paper espresso cup standing by. So Pretty much everything for the macchiato is ready to go. Now you can see the picture in the background. Now that I've put the Abbott Clever onto the cup and it's starting to drain through, now we're going to pull the shot. I've already steamed the milk. And sometimes with, these, with the really small volume of milk in, a, in the 12-ounce pitcher, it can get a little bit bubbly because it's a lot harder to control the, the power from the steam tip in such a low volume. So I'll sometimes steam that first and allow the bubbles to subside and smoothen out. And then I'm, as you can see, I'm swirling it to even out the texture before pouring. Oh yeah, there it is. Looking nice, looking nice. And so finishing up the, the Clever Brewed House Coffee so this is what I was saying earlier, that I really am trying to find a way to bring the drinks to the guests at the same time. I really don't like it 
as a diner, if I'm someplace where I have to wait or wait for somebody else's drink or, or for my own drink, you know, we wanted to have all the same. And as the caption said, it's time to reset and reload, as we've talked about already. After the guest leaves, we've served our drinks. It's time to prepare, really. And uh, now, if you can see the hopper of the espresso machine, it's getting kind of low. Time to fill up. Time to clean off the bar. And really, the to my mind, you know, when you when you have a, a guest come in, let's say you have a rush, okay. The challenge of the rush isn't really. To my mind, that challenge of a rush isn't the actual rush. It's everything before the rush. You know, do you have your station, in restaurant terms called mise en place, is your mise ready to go? Are you ready to meet the challenge? And if you are, great, then you're good to go. And so that's kind of the key. Is you, I'm always trying to, the, to my mind, the battle really is about getting everything prepared, getting everything clean, before the guests, the next wave of guests arrive. All right, so we're gonna we got an order Vietnamese iced coffee. <laughs> As you guys may know, it's my favorite drink to make. You know, I don't know why I have such a battle with this drink, but you know what? People order it, and I like some people ask, "Oh, what do you think of the Vietnamese iced coffee?" And I'm just like, "Oh, well, I, sometimes I think much. Well, I'd rather you not order it." But, you know, I always tell them it's, a del it's really delicious. You know, it really is chocolatey coffee with sweetened condensed milk over ice. I mean, there's really nothing not to love. I mean, there's just it's everything to love. So I really don't have a way to, to discourage people from buying it. <laughs> yeah, yes, it, it, like I've said before, it's always it's just the time that it takes to make. Right. So. Here we are, we placed our sweetened condensed milk in the bottom of our glass. And I've found that this is the ideal glass because it has just the ideal amount of liquid when you brew into it so that you get a great balance of flavors along with the ice and it's just the right amount to fill the cup and it's just, it all comes together with this glass. Everything just comes just right, you know. So we're using 15 grams of dark roasted coffee and we're putting that into the traditional Vietnamese cafe fin, which is this metal filter brewer. And so basically this metal cup has a bunch of perforations in the bottom of it. And then you put that cap on top of the bed of coffee to compress, which slows down the, the brewing time. And it just uh, comes out. I mean, the, the perforations are maybe not perfect and it's not... It's not like these portafilter baskets where everything's like precision, precision, precision. These fins are just kind of like stamped and, you know, they don't cost a terrible amount of money to, to purchase. But when you get the ingredients and the quantities right, man, it really is a lovely, lovely drink too, especially when it's warm and hot. I, I really do understand why people love to order it. And I've been tempted, you know, like I said, I, I, I really, for some reason, this is the most painful drink for me to make. And I've thought about, like, how can we shortcut it? Should we brew it with espresso instead? Or maybe we should we batch brew a really thick brew of coffee and use that instead? But at the end of the day, those are just compromises. Those are compromises designed to get around things. And... Really, that's just not how we do things at Spro, and that's not what we're about. That's not what we want to be. So, at the end of the day, uh, we're stuck. I'm stuck making it this way. In the old tradition, trying to keep tradition alive. Hopefully, people, you know, get to appreciate this aspect of it. I certainly do. I think tradition and brewing and understanding where things came from, how things started, I think is really an important part of the journey, or maybe not really necessarily important part of the journey, but I think it can be a very important part of the appreciation. You know, me personally, when it's things that I'm interested in, I like to learn a little bit more about it just so that I have a greater appreciation for it. And I think when you learn about the Vietnamese style iced coffee, it's got a really 
interesting background and history and how these guys in Vietnam got to using this fin and how it's still being used today in many applications. I think it's just a really interesting story. Even though it takes a long time to brew. As you can see, it's really just a waiting game. Add a little bit of water, wait. Add some more water, wait. Clean the, the cup. And so because we're using our Night Watch, which is our darkest roast coffee in these tins, there is some oil buildup or oil residue left inside our, our portioning cups. So typically I'll pour some hot water into it and then uh, wipe it clean just to keep, you know, just to keep it clean, you know, to keep it sanitary, sanitary and, and just nice. As you can see, I'm just chatting with our guest here. She's, um, she wanted the coffee and, you know, it's just a nice way to, to spend a little bit of time to get to know our new guests and, and let them see and tell them any, answer any kind of questions they have about the coffees or what we do and who we are. And also a chance for us to find out about them. So typically I'll, I'll ask, you know, what, do you, what kind of work are you involved in? And, or a lot of our guests come in and they're from out of town so, or have just recently moved to the area. So I'm always fascinated to know, you know, what brings you to town? What kind of work do you do? Why did you move to Baltimore, of all places? So here we are adding a little bit more water. And that's the thing, you just gotta pay attention, add a little bit of water, wait a little bit of while, add a little bit more water, wait a little while. But you know, one of the things we, tr we enjoy doing is that when the guests are, are with us and they wanna converse, I'm happy to spend the time to, to converse with them. And, and just, you know, some people we come in and they just need someone to talk to because of whatever's, whatever's going on in their world. Maybe they want to share a story. Maybe they've had some kind of challenge or heartbreak and they just need someone to chat with. And, you know, part of what we do at Spro is just to hear, just to offer an ear, to lend, to listen, and maybe even to commiserate it from time to time. So while I could be doing other things like cleaning and prepping things, you know, when a guest is there, they would like to chat, then it's even, it's always better to just to chat and give the people that, give someone just that little bit of time they, they would like to have. I find it very rewarding. Plus, it's a learning experience for us. You know, there's a lot of interesting people that come in from all walks of life, you know, from quite literally astrophysicists to, you know, the regular worker. You know, someone that works at the Amazon warehouse, and they all have something to share, all oh, some kind of insight to give into into our world, and I think it's just fascinating. Like, we had this conversation with a, with a bunch of the regulars one day, and they were talking about Amazon, how Amazon has taken over places like Sparrows Point in Baltimore that used to be part of the Bethlehem Steel Company, and how in those days... The steel workers could, would, could work at a factory in Sparrows Point and make enough money to have a future, to buy a house, to have children, to, to raise a family, and to retire, you know. And these new companies, while they're bringing new jobs like Amazon taking over Sparrows Point and building their, like, big warehouses, you know, are the people that work for them having the same kind of opportunity, the opportunity to have families, to have children, to have a future. And just so happens one of our other kind of, you know, somewhat regulars came in who works at that factory, at, at that warehouse and for Amazon and said to him, we said to him, hey, you know, you work at Amazon, well, how is it? Is it as bad? And he said, well, you know, they really work pretty hard. And I was like, well, is it worth it? And, he's, and he said, you know, it was worth it when they paid us more. So evidently they went from $17 an hour to $15 an hour during the pandemic. During this time when Amazon has been making more money than ever, 
because everybody's ordering online. And the, the pressure and the volume that they're pushing at the warehouse has increased dramatically. Evidently, they cut their wages by $2 an hour. And that was something that I think everybody that was there was like just shocked about. It's like, at this time, you're going to cut people's pay. So, you know, it kind of makes you wonder, like, you know, can people, can people in America today make a living, have families, have their own home, have a retirement? These are questions that I think we should be thinking about and hopefully getting a better answer for. Anyway, back to the Vietnamese iced coffee, which is finally finished. So the, as the condensed milk settles, we have to stir it and, and kind of combine it into the, the liquid, into the coffee, pour it over ice, and now offer the cap. Oh, that's already gone. <laughs> cap it, and then she takes it away. Great. All right, so here's our next guest, another one of our regulars. This is uh, Lee, and we're having macarons and the Canon RP. Uh, I just I ran into we, I spoke of a place called Service Photo the other the other earlier in the video, and um, Lee came in a few days earlier, was talking about getting a camera, and uh, getting a new camera, well a new used camera from Service, and I happened to run into him at Service that day, and so he came in this day and he had just bought the used Canon RP. And uh, was showing it to me, and I was like, oh, this is cool. <laughs> so the, you know, uh, Canon RP is a uh, mirrorless, a full-size mirrorless 35-millimeter digital camera. And actually, really quite nice. Nice quality. The price point wasn't too bad, it seemed, especially used. I was looking at the specs of it after that, and but the problem was that it, for my purposes, you know, for our YouTube channel, it's, it doesn't do 1080p 24 frames. It only does 1080p at 30 frames. And I like the cinematic quality of 24. I think this one we're shooting in, yeah, this one we're shooting at 24. It's running at 23.976 frames per second for those of you who are interested. And, um, yeah, he's just showing it to me. <laughs> I'm a long-time camera geek. You know, I've always really been... In, since I was in seventh grade, I was really into photography, and I used to shoot film all the time, and I had a bunch of different cameras over the years, the, almost all Canon. The Canon AE-1, the Canon F1, and that one, when I got to college, I actually had that the Canon F1, and I had it kitted out with motor drive and lenses and flashes and batteries and... You know, really everything you needed to be a, a proper photojournalist. And I, I did some stringer work for some publications. And uh, that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. But over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, I've kind of shied away from the photography side of things. Meaning that, you know, I worked in, in doing photos and I worked in uh, both video and motion picture production. And so I spent a lot of years looking through the lens, looking through a viewfinder. And after a while, I was just kind of like, I don't want to carry a camera anymore. And so for the last 10, 12 years, I haven't really carried a camera. Just mostly shooting everything on the iPhone whenever I traveled. And so it would have been, you know, looking back upon it now, had I bought nicer cameras that had, you know, video capability, I could have shot a lot more video for the channels. But, you know, that's neither here nor there now in 2021. But in case you're wondering, we use, uh, for most of the shoots that we're doing for the Spro channel, as well as the Ono Coffee channel, we're using the Sony ZV-1 digital camera. And that's really a camera that's designed, that's Sony designed for vloggers. And it's got a lot of built-in features that a lot of the bigger cameras don't necessarily have. But it's also a much more compact frame. Like, like you can see in the video here, Lee's RP has, has interchangeable lenses, right? Like most of the larger cameras. The ZV-1 that we're using for this video is a 
what they call a point and shoot. So it does have a variable zoom lens. However, it's not interchangeable. It's just built in like, like a point and shoot camera. But I think the video quality is really nice and the compact size is really what we're looking for we're, because eventually once the world reopens and we start traveling again, that's the camera that I'm planning to, to bring on a lot of our trips to, so we can show you here on the channel what's going on in the world of coffee around the world. And so I wanted something that was really compact and portable. And the Sony ZV-1 really is that. So I can put that on really small, lightweight stands like we're doing in here and, and just pull off some shots that are just a lot more difficult when you have a larger camera like the RP or, or some other ones. But it's always fun to come and talk to, to Lee about when he comes in to talk about cameras or even Al will come in and talk about cameras, Al, who you saw earlier. But Lee's an interesting guy. He comes in, usually gets a Cortado, and uh, he, he's actually a dance instructor, so really well-known and renowned ballroom and, I guess, uh, swing dancer. So he knows a lot about dance, competed in dance. Just really a, a great instructor who, uh, who, if you ever want to see, you know, learn about dancing in Baltimore, you should definitely look him up. But the nice thing about here, as you can see, the, the bar, I must have cleaned up as we're working. So the bar area is clean. Everything's swept up. There's no, you know, piles of grounds. There, every, the port filters are all cleaned and everything's ready to go for the next guest whenever that next guest comes in. And once I get all that swept away, that's really when I can really get down and, and groove and chat with the, the guests like I'm doing here with Lee and, and talk about whatever we're talking about. Probably more, more camera stuff and so I hope you guys are enjoying this video. This is definitely a, a, well, our longest uh, Cafe Verite video. We're pushing over, we're definitely over an hour by now. And, you know, it, how does this format work for you? Are you enjoying it? Do you find it too long? Too short? <laughs> Do drop that in the, uh, in the comments below. I definitely want to, would like to hear from you. And uh, if you have ideas for other videos in the future, please let me know those as well. I'm really interested. Um, yeah, and more importantly, come down to Spro. If you happen to be in the Baltimore area, come down. We're at 851 West 36th Street in Hamden. We're open 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. seven days a week. I'm in the shop typically Tuesday through Thursday. So come on down, hang out for a bit, have a coffee. And as you can see here, we're making Lee's Cortado. And, you know, under normal circumstances, prior to the pandemic, when we had in-house service with proper glass and cupware, the Cortado would be served in a five-ounce glass. Now everything is just eight-ounce cups. It's gonna, the volume is gonna be a little bit higher. But Lee likes his Cortados, and that's usually what he gets, and uh, there it is. Cortado, Cortado. So, you know, as soon as you finish, rinse out the port filters, get everything reset again, rinse the pitcher out, get it cleaned up. Wipe down everything. Place the, the spoons back in the dip well. Get the towel nice and folded so it looks attractive. Dump out the grinds. You know, we're getting close to closing time. So it's time to make sure that everything's swept up in, in nice order. But I hope you will enjoy this, this episode of Cafe Verite. It's, uh, it's great to spend this time with you and share with you our thoughts on coffee and what we do and how we do it. We're going to be trying to get more of these out. Typically, uh, we're looking at a release schedule once a week. And... Yeah. I don't know what else to say, but thanks for tuning in. Really appreciate you spending the time with us. Have a great day out there.